very much. Someone's been doing some interesting research, but I didn't tell you that. <laughs> okay, thanks ladies and gentlemen for coming here. I actually set the hall, kind of gave the topic for one of your challenges for this morning, the one on solar PV, but uh, Philip then changed it to fit in with the way that you can do it. So if you found that one interesting, well, you can blame two of us for that. Yeah, I have kind of taken you back to show you how people like you who start getting involved and interested in numbers and what we can learn from numbers and actually end up making a difference. I want to take you through very quickly a whole series of interesting things from before I went to Cambridge and then afterwards at Rolls-Royce Aerospace where I was based in Derby and then through on from 2002 or thereabouts when I started at the University of Derby. And I've done one or two rather interesting little projects. And I'll just bring you up to date with where I've got to on the latest one and why it's actually important. So let's get started. That's where Derby is, right in the centre of Dar uh, England. And the left hand photo at the top is how you, what it looks like, the main building. And then you can see on the top right our atrium where our students sort of pass through going to the various lectures. On the bottom left, you can see at night time one of our stairwells has some beautiful coloured lights which change with time. And then somewhere where I'm about, well, in about a year's time, the whole of the School of Computing Maths will move buildings into a new STEM building there, science, technology, engineering and maths. And lovely new facilities, which are going to be quite fun for us and also for the students. But, so what did I do? I, actually, after I finished my sort of K-12, 13 work, I went to work at Loughborough University for about a, a term and did a few interesting little things there. Documented their statistic packages. I wrote a whole set of hyperbolic trigonometry trigonometric functions for a little computer that I will show you um, in a few minutes. I did a bit of work for a friend of my family on life assurance policies or optimization. Worked at an organization called the British, uh, or the BSA Research Center. They met, were associated with making motorcycles. And then as an undergrad apprentice at Rolls Royce before I went to university for a year, I did a couple of interesting things. So that at the top right, the top left, is the first computer I worked on. Quite a bit issued physically. And that's why I was programming those sort of funny tank posh and so on pro, um, routines for them. That bottom left, that's how um, information data was stored in that computer. Little tiny rings of ferrite strung onto those little wires. And it held a box that size, 10,000 decimal digits, not even bytes, decimal digits. 10,000 of them. And that was the whole computer. It only um, read paper tapes and punch cards. And it stored, wow, two megabytes on that big physical hard drive. This is a box that size, square. We don't know how to make memory that tough small these days. That's what I worked on. Then, when I went to the BSA Research, Research Centre, this is when I was 18. And they had a problem, they had a gadget up the top left called a mic uh, electron beam microprobe analyzer. And they were firing electrons at those little metal samples at the bottom left and trying to work out by analyzing or recording and then doing something with the count of x-rays that it was generating. And it was a very complicated process. And that machine in today's money is at least a million Canadian dollars. And they could only use it for half a day a week because the calculations to actually work out what those accounts of the x-rays they got to turn that into the proportions of um, elements in that tiny little hemisphere of metal took them four and a half days a week 
to do the processing. Because it was an iterative solution. You couldn't just do it once, you had to do it several times and you ended up with a converging solution. And they gave them the challenge, oh, because they were typically using those sort of pipes there, the mufflers or the silencers of motorbikes and other things, and they were trying to find out what was happening to the metallurgy if they heated it up and so on. And they sometimes would send off their data to a uh, big organization in the UK who had one of these and a computer and had a computer program to do it, but it didn't work for their types of samples. It just thought, because it was just the one for them that they were using was designed for very, very heavy elements like sort of uranium at the back end, and they were using light elements right down at the beginning of the periodic table. And so I was given the challenge once I knew that I could do computer programming. Can you find a way of building an algorithm which we can use that can give us more running time and less computing time? And they gave me the books with all the formulae, and there were fundamentally two different theories and two different sets of formulae, neither of which worked properly. And so my job was to kind of meld those together, synthesize them, and I ended up with a little program ran in a time sharing system which was remarkably accurate when we standardized it against known samples. And I contacted them later on and they told me they were running the, this machine for four and a half days a week and doing only half a day of computation. So I'd made a difference. And I was only your age for many of you. You can do it. Then I went after some holiday to Rolls Royce and worked in the operations research department for about three months. <clears throat> and they had a problem because we didn't have Excel and its capability to take three parameters and produce a 3D bit um, graph that you could then rotate. We only had that little type of computer, the ones that were actually Rolls Royce, and it actually had 16,000 bytes. And they wanted me to produce a, a stereogram like you can see up the top there, or these three. I was working on the sort up up top left, sorry, rather than what you can now get today on, on the right hand side. And so I was just given the formulae for visualizing 3D and put stereo pairs with vanishing points and so on. And that kind of was helpful. But that was quite fun, and I learned a lot about how to do programming and being useful. Then, as I said, uh, the introduction said, I went to the University of uh, Cambridge, Jesus College. I did natural sciences for two years and then moved on to do uh, computing for my final year because I started off thinking, I like computers, I like the idea, I'd like to do material science and natural sciences for the first couple of years because I wanted to be able to apply computing algorithms <coughs> to be able to understand how metals work, how crystals develop, and how the strength works. But I soon realized that computers back in 1973-4 really weren't actually powerful enough to do that sort of thing. Remember, most of you have got something like one of these, a smartphone. In here is more computational capacity and memory than supercomputers in the 1980s. If you look at the Cray XMP, this has more oomph, more compute power than Cray XMP. It has vastly more memory most of the time than one of those did. So we are working in worlds where our compute power is absolutely staggering. It's not until you get through most of what I'm doing and showing you that we get closer to these sort of capabilities. So I went to university and I did one or two things there when I went back into university because uh, back to Rolls Royce because I was an undergraduate apprentice with them. So I spent a year with them before university, three years at university, and then went back and got a job. But, but during the long vac on the first year, I had to go back and did a six-week exercise, and I actually wrote a specification for a system that helped um, the company do something with the spares invoicing which then we ran for the next 35 years. That's interesting. An undergraduate apprentice, 
second year, well, I mean, between the first and the second year undergraduate, has written, designed, and specified a production system that ran for 35 years. Somewhat changed as circumstances change, but that's what you guys may be able to do, particularly if you come to somewhere like here, or maybe Ryerson with their connections to uh, business. Here, UT, a lot of connections as well. And some second year or third year up, um, undergraduates here go and spend a year in industry, learning how the real world really works. So Rolls Royce, over the next 30 odd years, 25 years while I worked there, these are some of the kind of projects that I worked on various times, teaching myself new languages to do some of these things more efficiently, more effectively. Doing some of this purely because I was getting so bored working on the calculator. And I was doing it again, again, and again. And I talked to one of my colleagues who comes from Canada, out in Manitoba, and he's an ace programmer. And I used to do quite well, maybe not as up to his level. But we both felt that one of the reasons why we are pretty good at it is because we're fundamentally lazy. Or we have a low boredom uh, tolerance, perhaps. So if we start getting bored, we would invest quite a bit of time in creating some software so that we can make life easier for, for ourselves. And that's what some of these here actually demonstrate. But I want to draw out some of the interesting things that came out of various projects from kind of about second year that I was in Rockwell Royce Party University. And this first one was I was given a project to try and forecast how much raw material the company needed of different material types, <coughs> different alloys, different metallurgy steels, aluminium, titanium, and so on. And one of the things we discovered fairly rapidly was that whilst we could, at the gross level, how many tons of titanium or how many tons of, of aluminium or magnesium or different types of steel, we had fairly stable forecasts. However much the input forecast of number of engines we were going to sell, which are those curves there and the numbers you see there, to give an illustration. They're not real, but they give an illustration. They showed that even with that kind of moving hockey stick that keeps changing and recovering at the front end, at the gross level, the number of tons of raw material, raw steel, was pretty stable. As you got down more and more fine resolution to the, number, the tonnage of quarter inch sheet steel or one eighth inch sheet steel using Imperial, that level became amazingly unstable. Forecasting the future at gross level isn't too bad. At the fine level, it's all over the place. Yes, we can forecast in terms of mortality, in the UK, there are going to be about 600,000 people dying every year, roughly. What you cannot identify is how many people will die a year in a little hamlet up in the middle of the countryside with a population of 200. That's not possible. And yet, last year or the year before, one of the forecasting organisations who produced um, life expectancy data and this is crystal ball gazing with a vengeance. We don't know what's going to change between now and when people die in the future. They said, if a little girl is born age, uh, born tomorrow in the UK, we'll have a life expectancy of, let's say, it was 85 or 90 years. But if you were born in this little tiny village, she will live to 105. Population? Simple terms. 
The next one was to think about um, forecasting warranty. And that's where I taught myself a really wild language that IBM had created called APL. And I was getting seriously bored trying to work out what was going to happen because one of those things in there had been designed and the engineers, with all of their clever modeling tools, um, finite element analysis, etc., 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 kind of were saying, well, we don't think it's going to meet the life that it ought to have. And we got 500 of those roughly out there in service, and we need to build the business program with our customers to help them to understand when they might have to pull the engines to replace that. And there will be various issues to do with calculating how much money we have to give them back and all sorts of things like that. And the problem was the estimates that the engineers were coming up with changed every week. So I was so bored with it. I invested maybe a couple of weeks building a little model that had all the data in it, all the functionality, and with one input parameter, hours or whatever, the cycles of life. And so when they kept coming up with a new version, feed it in, and five minutes later, it out, popped out on the printer. It helped work out the various options that we had. Then, almost to the last project, was to implement a huge new thing called SAP, an uh, Enterprise Resource Planning System, which did everything. Finance, project management, inventory management, um, scheduling, uh, and spares, management and distribution, all sorts of things. Covered every functionality of the business. And I owned the team who actually looked after the servers and tuned them. And I started recording all sorts of information about what was going on inside the server as it went live. And what this one's looking at was the number of um, the level of utilization of the CPUs. These were the largest supercomputer servers from Sun, the Sun Starfire machine with 16 um, boards with four processors that could hold 64 computers basically. And this sort of environment, you have to schedule or plan to only operate at about 50% utilization on average. And so what I'm showing here is the actual average utilization through the day and the peak level each day um, along the middle. And you can see we're typically hitting um, up to April around about 55%. And then one occasion after go live, we actually got as high as 71% utilization, which is kind of getting a bad sort of level. Okay, yeah. And so we, we, we saw what was happening on average and then the peak level during the day. Now why is that important? It's because you need with these sort of servers and Wintel servers to plan yourself on average to be about 50%. So that your peaks only go up to about 75%. But if you go over that, the actual throughput starts dropping fairly, fairly quickly. And I was talking to someone just recently who's leading the project in financial services and the project is being done for a particular client and they have come up with the daily sort of transactions or the weekly transactions that they need their new system to cope with. The company then suddenly said about four weeks before go live, um, actually we think we need twice that transaction there which as you'll see from that, going to cause them a bit of a problem. If they're set up for 50% utilization and now they've got twice that transaction throughput, their server farm is not going to be adequate. It also means in the UK, because we've got this British exit thing about the Pope, the referendum in uh, May, June, about whether we stay in or leave the, the European Union, if we're already seeing instability in the markets because they're getting nervous. And if and it's not certain what will happen in the financial services market with either a stay in or a go out uh, result, either of those could lead to a 
doubling and trebling of trans transaction levels. So that could mean every single financial services organisation in the UK for certain and maybe parts around the world with it on the ripple effect might suddenly find they can't actually cope with the transaction levels. So there are implications and consequences if you are running at that top high level. You might not be able to cope. So you have to think ahead and plan for it. And then a different one is, I was looking at the number of users day by day and during the day. And what's interesting, you can see, well, actually those are the daily peak numbers. And you can see Mondays is always a big number. Almost every single user would log in on a Monday. And then Tuesday and the Wednesday would drop down, Thursday would go up a little bit, and Friday would be you know, about 500, 600 users, which is about 15% of the user base wouldn't be using. And the little, you can't see, unfortunately, what's happening in the red one, it's too small. But they show you what's happening through each day. And again, there's really interesting patterns that also have consequences and implications for your actual operation and management and maintenance of your systems that gain lots of interesting consequences. And then I left uh, Rolls-Royce in around right May 2000 and joined the University of Derby in February 2002. Then a little gap doing something else. As was commented upon in the introduction, I'm doing stuff in learning analytics, stuff published in a uh, chapter in a book on how you can use analysis of results of students to decide whether or not your teaching approach is actually working. But what I want to work on or talk to you a little bit about is what I've been doing now on these, sorry, my students, my final year BSc students have been doing with me and for me for the last year and a half. On the case says, how accurate are these gadgets in working out where you are in the tags they put on your photos, in what they tell advertisers through the apps that you may have picked up, maybe you've got the Starbucks app, so that they can send you uh, invitations and discounts. And that's turned out to be really rather interesting. It came out about because I noticed that the photos I was taking up here didn't turn up on the maps in the right place. I noticed that if I used the Max Plus app and stood still, it would take me for a walk. If I changed or I rebooted my wireless router for a while, my frequent locations, which should have shown me where I was at home, were showing me somewhere else. It was going for a walk in the middle of the night. And some of them, you know, three o'clock in the morning for an hour, this had gone somewhere else. Which is kind of interesting given it was in my pocket in my jacket in the bedroom. This is kind of interesting when he goes for a walk. Um, I took some, a set of photos on the top right, a, a quick burst of 16 photos. The first 10 were 450 metres away from where I was, and it took 16 before they got nearly where I ended up. I went to Montreal, which is where I went, met Daria last year, and I went to the top of Montreal, up where that radio transmitter is on the first day when I arrived and took one photo, it was 4.9 kilometers away from where I actually was. I went up there um, three days later after the conference finished while I was waiting to catch my plane back to the UK and took a series of 50 photos, one every half minute, standing at the same place. And it was kind of interesting. What we, I did was then say, okay, this is a really cool project for students to do, because all they have to do is take 200, 400, 600 photos with their smartphone or a pair of smartphones, and they can map where they were and then calculate the error. Dead easy, much easier than doing questionnaires and surveys, which is a bit iffy. And three of them, I'm showing you three of the most interesting insights I've introduced that came out. This one was Victor actually using, actually using SAS JMP to do the work. And it shows that 
indoors, which is a particularly interesting environment, the Desire S, an older version of the HTC One, had a very, very different profile of accuracy indoors compared with the HTC M8, two generations newer. The HTC M8 was about 15 to 20 meters accuracy. The Desire S, well, on mode is about 120 meters. Very, very different. So that gave us one insight. Different devices, different generations, different levels of accuracy. This one was interesting. Car park. He identified a point between four parking bays, and on a day when the car park was completely full, so you've got lots of metal, lots of reflection, lots of dead points. He stood between four cars, took a photo down here, one here, one there. Came back on a Saturday when the car park was absolutely empty to the very same point and took three more at the same height. And you can see that the error is, uh, which one's which? The high level one when full was 100 meters error. The medium level one sort of just about the top of the, the hood, 400 meter error. And the one down here, 900 meters error plus. But when he went back on Saturday and took three readings empty, they're all within a Nats whisker 10 meter error. So this is actually quite interesting because you know how we see lots of these police chases where the detectives put a little GPS tracker under the, um, <coughs> under the car, on the um, fender or under the wheel arch. They are shown so that the police can then follow it remotely. This suggests that it might not actually be quite as easy <laughs> to do that as the films show us. Kind of fun. Another one was this one. This is what I was testing out when I was up at the top of Montreal. There's a start-up area. When you take one of these out and take a snap, the result is, to all intents and purposes, nearly random. But again, it comes down and runs within, here, something like 10 meters accuracy for a period, and then something blips. We don't know why yet, we think we know why, or we've got some ideas, but we need to do some more work. So it's kind of getting interesting. And what's important is those three people were, have, been, uh, have their names attached to presentations I've been giving now for the last year. Three people, one of those uh, and a couple of others, actually were co-authors of the paper I presented at SAS Global Forum last year about visualizing this sort of thing. And so my students are actually, as undergraduates, are getting their work published. Now here's the Montreal stuff, very briefly. First one on the Sunday, 4,900 meters error. Then I took that series of 50 photos every half minute, and without comparing with the real place to get the errors, I just um, presented it in latitude longitude terms. Um, as decimals of degrees, you can see I was standing absolutely still and look how much I was moving around the path. Quite a few meters. It just, as you stand there holding it like that, as a constellation of the GPS satellites are moving around, you go for a journey as well. More fun. By taking the EXIF data out of it, I could get the altitude. What it thought I, the height that I was at above sea level. Now the place I was standing at was actually, is actually about 231, 233 meters. And over a period of 20 minutes, I was still ending up something like 30 meters below where I really was. Yeah. We've also started looking at work on a big data set from Beijing and from Microsoft um, Asia. 
which has something like 17,000 journeys in it with the data collected from GPS trackers and sat uh, mobile phones like that at five second intervals. Something like, let's say, 17,000 journeys with about 28 million rows of data in total. I found just one which only had about 70 uh, data points, a little tiny journey down one of the light railways. And a, an incidental discovery is that whereas here, if you go to Google Earth, Google Maps, the maps overlay with the satellite photos <coughs> perfectly. Beijing, a series bias of 550 uh, meters eastwards for the map, compared with the satellite photos, and about 100 meters north. Kind of interesting. That was just a kind of incidental thing. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. It has interesting consequences. It means that whereas here in Toronto, you put in, I'm here, and I want to go there, postcode or whatever, and it drives you along the roads, and you put the satellite photos on, you see your track exactly on the roads on the image. It ain't going to work there. So what you are using, I see quite a few um, people who may be from China, it ain't going to work if you use Google Maps. Kind of interesting. Some interesting concepts. What I then was wanting to do, because part of the research which I'm doing with this particular data set is to try and identify if you've got individual data points or location points, or you've got a journey of data points, can you identify those points which are rogue, which are inaccurate. And if you just eyeball them, it's kind of difficult, and computers can't eyeball very easily. We go back, actually. Um, no, I won't go back. So I then started thinking, okay, well, because it's every five seconds, it's very, very reliable, I can actually calculate the velocity. And I can do it in an X, Y, east and west uh, basis as well, which is kind of useful. And you can see that bottom lot down the bottom where the velocity is, um, which might represent where it is going on the railway, perhaps. The stuff in the middle, right in the centre, is where something's moving quite slowly or it is stationary. And you've got those two odd ones down towards me and away from me, which are kind of a bit random. So what's happening? I then thought, OK, I could use velocity, but why don't I look at acceleration? That's another one. And that's sort of looking over again over five seconds. And suddenly you begin to see some really interesting stuff. So the four meters a second, that's not quite half a G. Now, human beings can accelerate at about half a G or even better over a period of about one second as you start walking hard. But you can't sustain that over five seconds. If you are on a railway, because you've got metal on metal, there is not a chance that you can have acceleration or deceleration of more than 0.1 g. That's the limit of coefficient of friction. So anything around about half a g over five seconds clearly has to be a rogue point. So that might be a way of looking at streams of data. Uh, where lots of organizations are now beginning to use streams of data to make decisions. And so they need to find ways filters or algorithms which will help them to filter out the road data. Because if you are uh, a transport manager looking after your fleet of lorries and you've got these data coming in from all of your uh, uh, lorries, you don't want to shout at your uh, drivers if they suddenly exceed the speed limit when that's sort of caused by a road um, data point. But suddenly says they're doing a thousand miles an hour decelerate a thousand miles an hour and then they're back to the speed limit. So and this is a real example that uh, an organization quite close to us in Derby had to cope with uh, when they started doing analysis of data being fed back from all their lorries. They needed to filter out in real time those road points. So what's all this about? What have I learned? What do I get come to the conclusion? If you want to understand the world, and because all of you have come here to do this OR challenge, optimizing a whole range of interesting different problems, 
One of the things you have to learn about is, and want to do is understand the numbers about the world. You need to think about the models. Because both the models in the mathematics and the statistics, but even more importantly, the models that you build in your head about how you think the world is working. And a model is just an abstraction of reality. The model is not the world. The map is not the territory. You have to remember as you build models, in everything you do, it is just a small representation of the real complexity. It's designed to narrow things down to things we think might be the real thing, or might help us to understand the real thing, but it won't include all the complexity. So you have to think about what the models are, and then what can they tell us? So one of the challenges that I would leave with you, you've done 10 different challenges today. You solved 10 different little models. Ask yourself, what actually does each of those models tell you and me about the way the world works as modeled in those 10 challenges? Insights can we get from all of this data? Those insights I tripped over at the very beginning of the location service and stuff. Be open to inspecting your data as you collect to see what comes out that you weren't expecting. The retailers at the conference I go to all think that location service on one of these gadgets will return plus or minus 10 meters as the old was where you are. And when I stand up like this in conferences with people from telecoms and from, uh, retail, they say, wow, didn't realize that it was that era. 20 meters, I can cope with, perhaps, most of the time. 500 meters, that's getting out. 1,000 meters, oh dear. 100,000 meters, that's a significant issue. And another piece of research done a couple of years, a year ago, looking at advertising application data, showed that 10% of all of the stuff being sent in and out with one of these for advertising purposes was less accurate than 100 kilometers. That has significant governance rep um, implications, reputation, because you don't want to receive an advert from Starbucks or whoever saying um, you're outside their shop in such and such and actually you're 30, 40, 50 million kilometers away. Yeah, that's spam. We don't like spam. We do not like the spam advertising. So there are yeah, these consequences. The other thing that came out, I hope I showed you, is some of the stuff I've done over my years, including when I was your age, changed the world, change how businesses work. You can do that as well. My students are already doing that. And they're only three years old for some of guys. There's the world is there at your feet if you keep your eyes open and think about the numbers and develop models in your head. Some of it is OR like. Think about numbers, love numbers, and there's amazing things you can do in OR, in analytics, business intelligence, all of those things that use numbers and statistics. You have a fantastic life ahead of you guys. Opportunities in a sense that I never had. Because we didn't have the computational capability, we didn't have the models. You're going to have a fantastic time in the future, guys. Thank you very much.